Thank you for sharing my screen now. Good evening, everybody. I hope you're all enjoying yourselves. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time on a Saturday or Saturday evening. I know it's not easy for everybody. Um, is that come up now? I think everyone's Is that Paul? Yes, it's yeah. clear on my side. Okay, good. All right, so this evening, <laughs> I'm gonna try and talk to you about the Congo Basin and hopefully talk to you about 10 things that you probably didn't know about the Congo Basin rainforest. And it's a very, you know, the Congo Basin is a very large area and it's a very complex area. And it's actually um, really hard to find only 10 things to talk about and keep it in a short period of time. But that's what I'm gonna try and do tonight. Um, if I get sidetracked and, you know, Chris, you can stop me, but I'm going to start by um, talking about the Congo Basin. And I'm trying to get this next slide up. So what is the Congo Basin? Where is it? Who is it? And a little bit about how is it? And uh, just a little bit about that. So let me, without further ado, move forward. So the Congo Basin Rainforest is right in the center of Africa. And when you think of the jungles of Africa, that is the Congo Basin Rainforest. It's really an incredible place. It's extremely rich. It's 1.8 million square kilometers of, of rainforest. And the Congo Basin gets its name from the Congo River. And the river gets its name from the Congo Kingdom. And basically this was a kingdom of people who lived in Central Africa about 1300 years ago to 800 years ago. It was a thriving kingdom for 500 years. And when the European sailors were trying to get to the, the Eastern part of the world, they were coming around Africa and they saw this big river and they stopped and that's where they got their water and they found out it was the Congo people, so it was the Congo River. And in fact, two countries also get their names from the river and the Congo people, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Congo Brazzaville or the Re Republic of Congo. But the Congo River is the second largest, longest river in Africa uh, after the Nile. And it's the deepest river in the world. And it's actually more than 220 meters deep in places. And when the US Geological Survey came out and started looking at this, they were astonished to find that no one really expected it to be this deep. And they were astonished to find that there are actually four ecosystems in the middle of this river, um, upper on one side, upper on the other side and then below it. And, and there's so much turbulence that the shear effects keep the species apart. So there are actually four different ecosystems in this very deep river in one section. Um, it gets its source up near in northeastern Zambia near Lake Tanganyika. It crosses the equator twice and it forms the distribution limit of a lot of different species, both mammals and, and, and other terrestrial species. So the Congo Basin refers to the hydrographic basin of the Congo River. The hydrographic basin is basically all of the water that, that lead into the river that ultimately discharges into the Atlantic Ocean. So it contains a dense network of tributaries, tributaries, small rivers, and streams. And I bet you one of the things you guys didn't know is the country of Gabon, which is so famous for its rainforests and it's very much an integral part of the rainforest of Central Africa, is technically not in the Congo Basin. So there are many types of forests in the Congo Basin. I'm gonna talk a little bit about them, but um, it's not just a homogeneous rainforest cover throughout. It's got various uh, rainfalls depending on altitude and, and geography. It in, it's got extremely wet areas along the coast. It's got incredible um, plant biodiversity. And there are even um, little patches of savanna that, that encroach in from the north and the south, as well as in the center of the basin itself. So the Congo Basin is the rainforest for most people. And the rainforest, as we know it, does exist predominantly in Congo, in the Congo Basin. And what's interesting is this is a really nice picture because you see the rainforest and you actually see what, what most scientists talk about, the, the four layers of a rainforest. So you've got your canopy layer, and that's what covers 
everything and blocks out the sun and absorbs the sun. But there are a few tree species that really need sun. And so they pop up above the canopy and those are called emergents. And you can actually see two emergent trees in the can emerging out of the canopy here. And then you've got your canopy, which is the, the, the layer that just really, when you fly over, it looks like a, a, a plantation of broccoli. It's incredible. And then uh, you've got the understory. And what's interesting is the understory is where you've got all the young trees and vines and things like that. And only 5% of the sunlight that strikes the, um, the forest actually gets into the understory. And then the last layer is the forest floor. And the forest floor only gets 2% of the sunlight. So it's very dark down there. Everyone else is muted. It's not just rainforest though, but we also have a lot of semi-flooded forests and swamplands, swamplands in the Congo Basin. And what's really interesting about this in Northeastern Congo around the Lactele area, recently researchers have done some digging and they found that a lot of these swamplands contain massive peat swamps. And, and peat swamps um, are basically areas where you've got this accumulation of partially decayed vegetation and it accumulates and accumulates and is one of the most efficient carbon sinks in the planet, sequestering and, and guarding CO2, which is really important for climate change. There are montane forests. These are high altitude forests up in the eastern edge of the Congo Basin, and they have their own unique um, what, uh, ecosystems. There, there are usually a lot of uh, clouds. It's much cooler, and the trees are not quite as tall. You've got the coastal forests that come all the way down to the, the, the where the forest meets the Atlantic Ocean, and this is uh, vast lagoon systems. They're also very moist, and there's a lot of mangroves. But there's also in the middle of the Congo Basin and throughout a lots of grassland and forest savanna mosaic. And this is interesting because you really don't think of these forests, but they do perform, they do form an integral part of the Congo Basin rainforest. They do get the same amounts of rainfall that dictates what a rainforest is. And what's interesting in, in one of the things you probably didn't know is that in the middle of the uh, Congo Basin, there's a thing called the, there's a, a geographic area called the Plateau Bateke. It's right in central Congo, uh, southeastern Gabon, and it's formed of these vast green hills, which are actually comprised of Kalahari sands that blew up there about 10 million years ago. So here you see what is today the Kalahari Desert, but over time a lot of it was drifting up, and when the world was a much drier place, the sands were there, but now they've been deposited and is now got full rainfall. But what's interesting is because it's sandy soils, even though it gets a lot of rain, the water leaches right away and out there. And so it doesn't have a lot of tree species and because it's sandy, it's very nutrient poor. So there's never been large herds of herbivores like you get in Eastern Africa, which has very rich volcanic soils. So the forests of the Congo Basin have undergone very large changes over very long time scales. And I'll bet you guys didn't know that uh, between 10 and two and a half million years ago, the center of Africa was a massive lake. And this lake is, is no longer exists. About two and a half million years ago, there were large geographic uh, and geological things were taking place in Africa, including the formation of the Rift Valley and uh, a lot of global um, ice ages started two and a half million years ago. And something happened about two and a half million years ago and the lake drained and it drained very rapidly in terms of geological time. And probably, I'm just gonna go back to this slide. Probably this lake's drainage was out through Gabon and what is today the Ogue River. But what happened when, whatever happened geologically that caused the shift in the lake to drain, it drained very rapidly, probably over the course of tens or maybe 100,000 years. And this vast amount of water came streaming out of probably what is the, the Congo River today. And here you've got this amazing image from Google Earth, which shows the Congo River. It comes and the water flows down and it flows out and this is where it empties into the ocean. And even though the Congo River has a lot of water coming out of it, it doesn't have enough water to dig this massive and very deep trench in the ocean floor. This could only have happened when a very large body of water emptied very rapidly and, and it was just, you can imagine this water pump just tearing up the floor. One of the other interesting things about the Congo Basin is there's a tiny little island just off the coast of Cameroon. It's only 32 kilometers away from Douala, which is a major port in Cameroon. It's called the Island of Bioko. 
And what's interesting about this island is it contains Congo Basin rainforest habitat and many of the species that inhabit that. And what's interesting about this is that for the last two and a half million years, there have been a series, about 20 different ice ages that, that, uh, that affected the, the, the entire planet. And during these ice ages, there were massive glacier, glaciers that covered Northern Europe and Northern, the, the Northern Hemisphere, essentially. And these glaciers trapped a lot of the water that was normally out in the oceans and in the lakes. And as a result, the sea level dropped up to 200 meters. And during the glacial maximum, the island of Bioko, and you can see here, it's very close. The island of Bioko was only, was attached to the mainland. And so all the wildlife that you find in the Congo Basin, you also find on this island. But when these glaciers melted and the sea levels went up again 10,000 years ago, this, this little area became an island. And so all the wildlife that you have on the island, even though it's Congo Basin wildlife, it's been isolated for 10,000 years. It's been, it's evolutionary been diverging from the mainland. And it's an amazing place to study the wildlife, especially if you're a genetic phylogeneticist who is interested in using genes because you can actually calibrate a molecular clock because you have a known divergence state. So we know exactly when the last animals on this island were reproductively connected with the animals on the mainland. So going back to this lake and the different types of species and species distributions in the Congo Basin, um, I just want you guys to think about one thing as I talk about the species that, that we're going to find there. And that this is a lake. It's in the middle of the country and it's a geographic barrier. Animals on one side are not going to be reproducing with animals on the other side. But you've got a concept called the ring species concept. And basically here you've got a representation, a schematic drawing of what is taking place in, in goals in the, in the Arctic. And you've got a goal that will have migrated around the Arctic. And over time, it accumulates change. It becomes slightly different, becomes slightly different to the point where, when it's migrated all the way around and comes back upon its original population, they're diverse enough that they're not actually going to interbreed. Here's just another indication of that using a sort of a lake as a geographic barrier. You've got a, 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 an ancestral population that's that's starting to move around this geographic barrier, starting to disperse because it's got favorable habitat that it's moving into on both sides. And by the time it gets around, they've accumulated enough differences that they no longer reproduce. So that's an interesting concept. This lake was here 10, 000, 10 million years ago, up to two and a half million years ago, when the species that we see today in Africa were had their ancestors, and those ancestors evolved into different species. Excuse me. So here we have some diagrams from some of the old texts showing the lake in the middle. And this is a representative of the distributions of, of bush bucks. And this is um, a representative of, um, of, of wildebeest. I'm sorry, not wildebeest, but the heart of beasts. And it just gives you something to think about that the species distributions that we see today are very interesting and maybe best understood in the uh, if you take into the historical context of the geology and time of the Congo Basin. And this is true of all the primates as well. You've got very similar species of mona monkeys who are distributed throughout the continent, but you see they're slightly different, slightly different. And if you just realize that there was a lake here when these animals were probably dispersing throughout Africa, you, you get a better understanding. And the same is true with the Gwenins. Here you've got a, a very similar species. If you took their skin off and just removed the colors on their faces, they'd almost be identical. And they would probably breed in captivity, but they're not. And, and if you really, it just, it's just a, a thought exercise for everyone to try and understand how important it is, especially when I talk about some of the other primates in Africa. And so you know there are four different types of gorillas that live in Africa. And I'll bet you a lot of people didn't know that there were four different types. We've got the Western lowland gorilla, which is found in Central Africa. We've got the Eastern lowland gorilla, which is found in Eastern DRC. We've got the mountain gorilla over in the high altitude forests of Rwanda, Uganda, and DRC on the very edge of the basin. And you've got the cross river gorilla, which is just in a small area between Nigeria and Cameroon. And what's interesting about gorillas excuse me, is they all only are only found north of the Congo River. So basically north of that old lake. 
Now you've got your mountain gorillas and there's only 10,063 mountain gorillas left in the world. And they're confined to this very tiny mountainous population. These are three contiguous national parks in three different countries. And these national parks are bordered right up to the edge of the national park with farmland and some of the highest dense populated places on the continent. And so when you go visit the mountain gorillas, we know where they all are and it's a semi-captive population. They can't go anywhere. Now, what's interesting about mountain gorillas is because they live in these high altitude montane forests that, that don't have a lot of fruiting trees, they're mostly herbivorous, meaning they mostly eat grasses and the stems of very celery-like bamboo. But because it's colder and they're also much more terrestrial because they don't have to climb up into the trees to find their food. But because it's cooler because of the altitude, their fur is much longer than any of the other gorillas that we have. Now, a very close relationship to the mountain gorillas are the eastern lowland gorillas or what we call growers gorillas. And depending again, if you're a lumper or a splitter, some people like to think of them as four species. Others like to think of the mountain gorillas and the eastern gorillas, two subspecies of the same species. Um, these are also highly threatened. They're, they're the largest of the gorillas, but there's only about 3,000 3, of them left. And they're only found in these very fragmented populations and protected areas in Eastern DRC, which just isn't a very optimistic look at, uh, outlook for them. Even more depressing, <laughs> but these are really wonderful animals, are the Cross River Gorillas. And the Cross River Gorillas are closely related to the Western Lowland Gorillas. They're only found in a very remote and very um, tiny area of very fragmented forest right at the borders of Cameroon and Nigeria. And there's only about 250 of those left in the world. Now, the Western Lowland Gorillas, this is probably something you didn't know, but it's not one of the things I'm gonna quiz you on later, is that there are more than 125,000 Western Lowland gorillas in Northern Congo alone. And in 2008, the Wildlife Conservation Society did a, a landscape level survey to look at large mammals and they were astonished to find that in some of the most swampy forests, there were very large populations, unrecognized populations of gorillas. So it's, it's an amazing thing, even though there's so many of them, they're highly threatened because of habitat loss and disease, such as Ebola or even the COVID virus could sweep through and actually destroy them. Um, their habitat being the, the primary rainforest of the Congo Basin has a lot of fruiting trees. And as a result, these primates are much more arboreal or they spend much more of their time up in the treetops. But they also spend a lot of time on the ground. And I'm gonna give my same shameless plug for the Congo Conservation Society in Ozala. If you'd like to see them, you can go see them in Ozala at the Ozala Discovery Camps. And here you've got a beautiful picture of a magnificent silverback and a group of tourists taking photos of them. And this could be you someday. Now, one of the things I'll bet many people didn't know is that there are two kinds of chimpanzees that live in the Congo Basin rainforests. And what's interesting about chimpanzee distribution is the common chimpanzee, the pan troglodytes, lives only north of the Congo River. And the other chimpanzee, which is used to be called the pygmy chimpanzee or the bonobo, is found south of the Congo River. And the common chimpanzees are interesting because they occupy a vast number of habitat types and they're very adaptable, but they all have very interesting social uh, behaviors that they do differently. And much of their behaviors are actually transmitted culturally, meaning from mother to child. It's not an, an innate, they're not born knowing it. So, in, in Eastern, in, sorry, Western Africa, around the Liberia, Sierra Leone, and, and Ivory Coast, the chimpanzees are known for using stone tools to crack open nuts. In Eastern Africa, or Eastern DRC, the chimpanzees are known because they have this very unusual hunting behavior where they hunt other animals and share the meat. And of course, in Central Africa and, the, and, and elsewhere, chimpanzees are widely known because they use tools to actually get honey, they use tools to dig out termites, and each grouping of chimpanzees, each chimpanzee culture has different tools that they use for different techniques and it's all culturally transmitted. The bonobos, Pan paniscus, is a different species of chimpanzee and it's only found in central DRC south of the Congo River. And if you look at the distribution map, that's almost where that old lake was. And probably what happened is you had these animals, these great ape ancestors, 
widely distributed around the lake. And as the lake disappeared, the bonobos were probably on this side and then they started moving into this newly created habitat and then drainage. But like all um, common chimpanzees, bonobos are, are widely adaptable. They live in a wide range of habitats and they're widely known to be a chimpanzee that's much less aggressive than their, their, their cousins, the common chimpanzee. And they have a, an unusual behavior that whenever they get into a conflict situation, they resolve that conflict rather than by fighting, but more by giving hugs. And that makes them very cool. The rainforests have been engineered by hidden giants. And when I see hidden giants, I'm talking about the forest elephant. Forest elephants are a separate species of elephant. They have a very different social structure and, and body plan because they live in the very dense rainforest. So socially, they don't live in large herds. Their herds are primarily um, just the female and her infants, and most of the males are solitary, but they still eat like elephants. They consume up to 200 kilos of vegetation a day, and they have an incredible influence on the forest because there are at least 335 species that we know that are, 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 are <laughs> they're actually dispersed. The seeds of these species are dispersed in elephant dung. And so when an elephant eats the fruit, the seeds go into the dung, and then later it comes out and is dispersed far from the mother tree. And elephants disperse seeds much farther than any other animal in Africa, even farther than birds. And what's interesting is a large number of these trees, or these seeds, their germination is actually accelerated when they go through the, the, the digestive tract of elephants. So they do play a very major role in the, the forest composition, the bi biological composition of the forest. And there are even some trees who are obligates. Their seeds will not germinate unless they actually pass through the, the digestive tract of an elephant. But it's not just seed dispersal that elephants um, shape the forest with. They are big animals and they move around a lot. And as they move from fruiting tree to fruiting tree, they create these paths in the middle of the forest. And you can see there's a, a, a food resource here or a resource here, a keystone resource, which is mineral salts. And they come out of the forest and they create these paths all throughout the forest and they keep this clearing open. And that's so that they can get their mineral salts. And you can see here just images of elephants actually digging up the forest floor. So these very large animals have had a major influence on the shaping of the forest for many, many millennia. So that's, this is what most people think the Congo Basin ecosystem is, right? Beautiful forests, lots of clearings, lots of wildlife. But guess what? The ecosystem actually takes place with humans. Humans are part of the ecosystem, and they have been for hundreds of thousand years. In Gabon, there is actually some archaeological evidence going back as far as 400,000 400, years of early human habitation. And humans have been influencing the rainforest as well for thousands of years. Here you have an aerial view of slash and burn agriculture. This is the rainforest, and it's been cut down, and some farmer is going to plant his crop there, and it's going to be a nice crop of manioc or rice, and it's going to be used for a year and then he's gonna let it go fallow and it will grow back. And what's interesting is a lot of these forest trees will have, there's a nice seed bed there and the amount of sunlight will allow a lot of regrowth and you get a regeneration of the forest. And this is not necessarily a, a negative thing on the forest if it's not done extensively, but the more people there are, the more areas get degraded and it doesn't grow back. But it, it's, a, it's a slash and burn agriculture. And what's interesting as well is a lot of researchers who've been living in the Congo Basin for years and doing work in these very remote areas in these absolutely pristine areas where there are no people go into these streams and they find in these stream beds and they find these little black seeds. And these are the grains of palm nuts and palm nuts and these palm trees, although they're native to Africa, they need to be cultivated. They're, they don't grow naturally in the forest. And if you go into these forests, you actually don't find any living palm trees. So these researchers, they carbon dated these palm, palm nuts and they found that most of them date back to 2,300 years ago. And that the, that the, old, the, the youngest of these were 900 years. And, and, and from 900 years till present, there's almost no palm trees. So essentially the rainforests that were pristine today were heavily populated 2,000 300 years ago to 900 years ago. We still don't know why and where these people went, but it's clear that the rainforests have had a lot of influence 
from humans. And another thing that humans do to the rainforest is they burn it. And this is just a, a picture of the same area taken several years apart in an area where they started implementing a fire management plan. And so this savanna, this picture above is of a savanna forest mosaic where the savanna was burnt every year. It was just part of what the villagers did. And in 1994, they took a picture and they started to control it and they stopped burning. And you can see below, this is the exact same forest taking the exact same spot. And the rainforest is rapidly expanding and taking over the savannas. So that's sort of the impact of humans. And I'm just gonna give you one last bonus of the 10 things that you didn't know about Africa. I bet you guys didn't know that the geographic heart of Africa, the geographic center of Africa is in the Congo Basin. And this was determined by the International Geographic Union and the Department of Environmental and Geographical Sciences at the University of Cape Town using a method called the center of gravity method. And essentially, if you were to take the continent up and balance it and on your fingertip, that would be the point that you would balance it. And what's interesting about this is the geographic center of Africa had never been explored. It was in, it was in, in a very remote part of Northern Congo and this great South African adventurer, Kingsley Holgate, decided that he was going to lead an expedition and plant a, uh, just to, you know, mark the center of Africa. So he amassed his group of people and he got some water in a very special gourd that he collected at the cradle of human civilization. And he left on his journey through many African countries to get to Congo and into the, the Congo basin and at the heart of Africa. And he, he led the, the charge in Land Rovers and a group of Land Rovers followed him all the way to the border of South Africa and Namibia, where then he and his three vehicles and his team continued on by themselves until they got to the rainforests. And then they had to abandon their vehicles and go up by foot. And unfortunately for Kingsley, the, the heart of Africa happens to be in a very inaccessible rainforest. It's a semi-flooded forest. And so the last 13 kilometers were very challenging and nearly killed him, but he made it. And here you can see they've got their monument to the heart of Africa which they posted there. There's the gourd, which they poured the water from the cradle of civilization out. And as a result of this, they were able to take this picture with his team and the group of Baaka pygmies that led him for the last 13 kilometers, South Africa, Congo, and the heart of Africa in the Congo basin. And I know it's a Saturday night and I know that everyone wants to go out and have a drink. So I want to thank you all for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thanks very much for the talk. It was very, very interesting. But there's one particular question I have on many of the conservation issues and particular, particularly for Africa. And that is about the Chinese. How involved are the Chinese in, the central, in central Africa? Because I know that they are getting involved in many places in, in Africa and it concerns me because it seems like their main object of this is growing food. Well, the Chinese are definitely involved in the Congo Basin, um, although they're not that interested in growing food. They are interested in logging and taking the timber to China. and and also in mining. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's an issue because these governments are, are underfunded. They don't uh, generate a lot of tax wealth. And so they're very happy to have Chinese businesses come in, whether it's for mining or timber. The problem is that the Chinese don't always do things um, in the best way. And so you've got companies that will um, not respect environmental issues. A lot of them don't pay their employees very well in the logging companies. More often than not, the employees of, of the companies have to hunt. And that means they go into these areas where they've never had humans before and they, they clean out the wildlife. So it's an issue. The national parks are important and it's important to keep them intact. Um, there will be Chinese. I think they're everywhere, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Paul. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. 
You made one remark about Corona, about COVID, uh, possibly endangering these uh, animals. And I was wondering what more you know about that and um, if anything is going on to protect them from this particular disease or what could be done to protect them? Well, um, yes. So we know that great apes, both gorillas and chimpanzees, being as closely related to humans as they are, they suffer very much the same symptoms that we do, um, except for the fact that they live out in the wild and their immune systems tend to be right on the edge. And so even things that don't have such a negative effect on us, they could actually push them just over the edge. So even a common cold from a human to a gorilla could be very dangerous to them. Um, the COVID virus is not circulating naturally in their environment. So if it is brought into their environment, it could have a negative impact. What's being done about it? Um, most, well, I can tell you that in, in Northern Congo, it's a, an extremely uh, important thing that we're dealing with. We're not allowing any tourists to get near the gorillas that we control. The Congolese government's working very hard to control the, the virus circulation in Congo as well. They're also under a lockdown similar to what's going on here. And, and the people are not going out to have face-to-face -face contact with the gorillas. And that's the best way to handle it. And hopefully when this virus ultimately runs its course, the humans that will be visiting wild animals, whether it's gorillas or chimpanzees and mountain gorillas or Western lowland gorillas, they will be vaccinated and symptom free and not bring it into the populations. But just let me add that, you know, the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, has put forth guidelines for best practices for grade eight tourism. And these best practices are actually designed with the knowledge that human diseases, unknown human viruses may have a negative impact. And so the recommendations are you keep a distance of seven meters, you wear a mask in the presence. And again, we've learned through COVID that the masks are not there to prevent you from catching something, they're to prevent you from spreading something. So if you respect the IUCN guidelines, whether it's COVID or some other unknown virus, you are already doing what you can to prevent the contamination into the gorilla populations. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I'm curious to know how often you bumped into things like a carpi and Congo peafowl and water chevrotains and fascinating animals like that. Are they still around? Are they common? Well, <laughs> no, they're not common. Uh, water <laughs> chevrotains are more common than some of the others, but they're very cryptic. Um, they are very shy and they do their best to blend in. And one of the real challenges with the wildlife in the rainforest is that you can't see them because of the forest. Um, they're also very concerned about the large cat predators. There's a lot of leopards, so they have good camouflage. They're very quiet. Um, and, and, and the trees in, in, the, in the rainforest actually do a very good job of keeping you from seeing things. I have seen chevrotains. I've seen golden cats. I've seen, I haven't seen okapi and I haven't seen the peafowl. Um, Okapi are found in a very restricted distribution in Eastern DRC, which I have not had the pleasure of visiting for any length of time. Um, but I've seen melanistic leopards. I've seen all sorts of really incredible things in my years. I've seen Solatus monkeys, um, gorillas, chimps, you name it. Um, but you've got to spend a lot of time actually in the forest to see it. It's, it's just a lot of it's luck. Or if you know somebody who's studying it, then you if you're lucky enough to get to follow them out to their study groups. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Paul, here's a question uh, in the chat from yeah. Sispi Lian. Why masks are not compulsory in Uganda, both in gorilla and chimp tracking? Do you know? Magdalena, if you want to come in too, you're also welcome. Oh. Well, they should be consult. They should be compulsory. Um, it's just a question of whether or not um, the, the the people want to do best practices. Um, you know, God forbid that some tourists take a disease in and wipes out the population of mountain gorillas. You know, there's only there's just over a thousand, and if something burns through, it'll be terrible. And it's not really good practice not to wear the masks. I can't control them, unfortunately, and 
the recommendations are there. They've been created by veterinarians and, and people who know the right things to do. And it's just up to us to respect that and hold ourselves to the high standards. Um, Sabila, I'm going to give you a turn just now. Martelena, would you like to add something? Yes, uh, um, just to complement what Paul was saying. Um, uh, uh, Sabila, just a minute. Yeah, Martha. Uh, um, yes. Uh, to complement what Paul was saying, that uh, just at present, uh, we can say that uh, from uh, COVID-19, there's a lot of places that first time they were reacting quickly to the situation. They were bringing masks. Now the, the thing is, once they applicated that, probably some of them, uh, they were already continuous with this process because there is nothing wrong to, to use something that protect you uh, for different kind of things. That some ones we know, some other ones we, we can know in the moment that we go. There is always emotions in the moment that they approach the animals. And the recommendation is that uh, we all we applicated that. And it's always recommendation. Uh, but I think that a lot of people is changing, actually. Thanks, Marta. Sibyl? Um, yes, just to comment on that as well. Uh, up until certainly about three, four years ago, I don't know if it changed. It was also not compulsory in Rwanda when you went to see the mountain gorillas. However, when seeing the eastern lowland gorillas in Kahuzi Dega National Park, it was compulsory to wear a mask. So they, I think the countries have different ways of how they handle it. Also, how close are the trackers allowed to uh, be? At, you know, how close are they allowed to come to the gorillas? In, in Rwanda, they have to stay behind uh, at quite a distance. Um, I'm sure with the situation now with COVID, in, in most countries where they didn't make it compulsory with a mask, it, it is probably going to change. Um, that's what I, what, what I think. But I mean, Rwanda is also in lockdown, complete lockdown now. There's no, there's no tourism, nothing at the moment. Um, so we'll have to see what happens, what happens in the future. Thanks, Abil. Paul, any comments? No, I just uh, have to agree with that. I think that uh, this COVID thing will hopefully um, wake people up. And, and I will say that one of the, the, the leading uh, hotel owners or lodge owners in East Africa um, that specializes in the mountain girls recently reached out to me to get my feedback on the right things to do. And, uh, and that's a very good sign. Um, 